So since nuclei have a magnetic dipole, that means their energies are split to different levels when they're in a magnetic field. And we've seen that even in a weak magnetic field, there's a very slight excess of nuclei in one state over another. Turns out when you put them in a much stronger field, uh, the uh, difference in population can be large enough to do something useful with. So let's say we have a magnet with a, a strength of 11.75 Tesla. So if we build an instrument in a chemical laboratory with this large magnet in it, maybe an instrument that you've heard of or used before. This is an instrument called a nuclear magnetic uh, resonance spectrometer. So nuclear magnetic resonance, or NMR, is the technique that we're talking about. So take a very large magnet with a, a magnetic field strength of as large as 11.75 Tesla in this example. What that means is for protons, the difference in energy between the spin up and the spin down states of a proton in this magnetic field will be about 3.3 times 10 to the minus 25th joules. So this is uh, about six orders of magnitude or so larger than the Earth's magnetic field. So this is large enough that the difference in energy is beginning to be comparable um, to KT, uh, still a few orders of magnitude less than KT. But what that means is we can uh, begin to use this difference in energy, 3.3 times 10 to the minus 25th joules, to detect how many uh, protons are in the upper state or the lower state. So um, for example, the way we can detect a, a nuclei, uh, a nucleus in the ground state uh, is by exciting it into the upper state. So if we shine some electromagnetic radiation, a photon with energy exactly equal to delta E on this state, then that uh, nucleus can absorb that photon and jump up to the higher state, just as we've seen for lots of electronic degrees uh, of freedom in the past. So what that means is the frequency of the photon that we would wish to use to detect protons in the spin-up state and promote them to the spin-down state. If we want to calculate what the frequency of that photon would be, that energy in this particular magnet divided by Planck's constant we do that math, that turns out to be a frequency of 5 times 10 to the 8th per second, or converting to hertz, that's 500 times 10 to the 6th hertz, or 500 megahertz. So when we say that a particular NMR instrument is a 500 megahertz NMR machine, what that means is photons of uh, frequency 500 megahertz have the proper energy to excite uh, protons in the uh, magnetic field of the magnet inside that NMR. So uh, 500 megahertz is a fairly typical field strength for, uh, for fairly typical uh, strength of the magnet in a typical NMR instrument. So what this means is that NMR instruments can be used essentially as uh, proton detectors. If you have a sample which you've put inside the magnet, so this whole sample is in the presence of a very strong magnetic field, then you shine radiation. And I've called this radiation, so let's talk a little bit about what type of radiation it is. Um, the, the frequency of these photons is 500 megahertz. So the wavelength of those photons, so let's see, wavelength would be Hc over delta E, uh, so that would be the same as uh, HC over H nu, so that's C over nu, and that's going to work out in our case to be 1.7 meters. So these are not visible photons with wavelengths in the nanometer range, they're not infrared photons with wavelengths in the uh, micrometer range, they're not even uh, microwave photons. These are uh, photons with wavelengths in the 1.7 meter range. Those are radio photons. So this is not light the way we think of light. This is electromagnetic energy in the radio portion of the spectrum. So we're uh, essentially shining radio um, 
frequency energy at our sample. And then if we have nuclei, spin up and spin down nuclei in some proportion in this sample, the lower energy spin up nuclei in this magnetic field can absorb some of these photons. Some of the photons will pass through unabsorbed. Some of them will pass through and be absorbed by the photon and promote those uh, nuclei up to the higher energy state. Uh, so we could either, by, absor by observing the absorbance, how many of the uh, radio frequency photons go in compared to how many come out, we can observe how many of them are absorbed and use that to determine how many protons uh, absorb those um, photons. Or even better, what goes up must come down. So after we've excited one of these electrons up to the upper state, by having it absorb a photon with this amount of energy, eventually it will fall back down and it will emit a photon with the same amount of energy. And that photon will be emitted in a different direction, most typically, so we can detect photons that are being emitted with that energy in some other direction. So the earliest versions of nuclear magnetic resonance instruments were exactly this. They were just proton detectors. They determined how many protons were in the sample that absorbed energy of the uh, appropriate uh, frequency. And modern day instruments like the, the MRA instrument, if you go to the hospital and get an MRI or a magnetic resonance imaging uh, scan, then that's essentially a, a very advanced, um, updated version of the same technique. And MRI is basically just a proton detector where they shine radio frequency energy at the human body. And then by detecting which areas of the body have more or fewer protons in them and using some additional techniques on top of that, uh, that's what gives you the, the MRI scan. But from a chemist's point of view, what turns out to be more useful than just detecting how many protons there are and whether they absorb energy is the fact that when you um, observe these protons in an NMR, it turns out they don't absorb energy of exactly the frequency we think they would by just considering their magnetic dipole. And we can learn a lot more information by understanding uh, why that energy is not exactly the same as what we predicted it will be.